assists. But coming up now, we've got your academic officer debate featuring Thomas Ron and Tamaki Laycock. Now, unfortunately, Lizeth in the Flores is not here, but uh, let's first hear what the academic officer role entails. Candidate interview night 2016. Academic officer. The academic officer represents students on issues relating to their course, teaching and learning facilities. Yes, it's set to be a hot debate here with hopeful returner Thomas Ron Vine for another term in office. Uh, you are wise, Alex Light will be chairing the debate for your next academic officer. Candidate interview night 2016. Academic officer, candidates debate. So, Obviously, there's only two of you here. It's going to be quite an intense debate. <laughs> I, uh, I don't. So, if we start with Tamaki, yes. and then on to you, Thomas, uh, can you give me a summary of your main points in 20 seconds? Ooh, okay. Diversity, accessibility, negotiation, campaigning, empowerment, all to help students, here to listen to students, and here to work with course and department reps for a better University of York. Okay. I want to have a second year so that I can finish the job I've started. Over the last year, we have made tremendous progress with more reps than ever before being elected from a more diverse background than ever before, with a lending laptop scheme in the library, as well as more lectures than ever before being recorded. But we're still not doing enough to get our students the jobs they want. So I'll fix that in two ways. One, by getting more years in industry so students can get real-world job experience. And two, getting research internships with our top academics so students can boost their CV. I also want students to be more prepared for lectures in the next year. So I'll have sample lectures of all optional modules so we know what we're getting into. Okay. So, obviously, it's quite an interesting debate with the current officer being sat here as well. So Absolutely. there are some questions that will be applicable to you in different ways. Um, and I know some topics that you're quite passionate about, both of you, but uh, the first one I'm going to open with is one about a policy that you've seen through a lot, Thomas, but how needed do you feel that lecture capture is and how much of a priority should that be for the academic officer or are there areas that you think are more, um, that are more needed to be focused on in the union? I think... Lecture capture is definitely something that's needed in the university. I think um, because one of my points is accessibility and it definitely goes into that. It's for the student's need and obviously for different departments it applies in different ways but I think it needs to be a priority to make sure that every student has the same opportunities. Okay. When I got elected this was one of my main priorities. And over the last year, I have doubled the number of departments that are on the opt-out system of lecture capture, where a lecturer who does not want to record has to actively choose not to record rather than choose to, which makes it, of course, a lot easier. Um, we've doubled the number of departments, which is really great, and I'm hoping to do more. But I think lecture capture is important because not only does it help students with revision, help them go over some difficult topics. It also, it, not only is it more accessible for students, but it in fact changes the way lectures are done. Rather than someone pontificating at you, you can flip the classroom, get important information sent out early so the debate is, so that the lecture is more interactive. You have more examples of um, mm. great work and um, students can go over work again and again. It's a tool for the lecturer as well, actually, because the lecturer gets to see where did the students not understand? Okay, they can explain so, that again. It's worked well where it's been done, and I want to see it rolled out to even further levels, and that's something I've done, and I'm going to continue to do. Okay, so I'll put it in a slightly different context. Uh, your time in academic officer, in the first two weeks, lecture capture is fully embraced by the university, is rolled out across all departments, and it's there instantly accessible. What's your next big thing? I think jobs for our students. We as a university are not doing enough to get our students the jobs they want. And that's a travesty. We're paying 9,000 pounds a year. We need to get the jobs we want. And this has been recognized by major surveys such as the destination of leavers in higher education. The way we're gonna do that is by getting a lot more years in industry, getting students to go out into the job market before they finish their degree 
getting real experience, working with our academics, not just in lectures, but getting them out there in the summer for research internships. So, you know, if you're a psychology student, you're interested in the research Gavin Phillips does, you spend a summer working with him, boost your CV, and you get a sparkling reference out of it okay. and great experience. Okay, Tamaki? I think before, although jobs are obviously a very important part and one of the reasons why we go to university, we do need to focus, well, I think we need to go further with accessibility. Uh, Thomas and I were at the Disabled Students Network meeting and uh, one of the questions that I brought up to the students there was what else can be done? And it was, um, I definitely realized my privileges as an able bodied person there when it was brought up how many places were inaccessible by wheelchair, inaccessible for certain people um, for many different reasons. So I think I would prioritize making sure that students here were able to focus on their university degrees because if you can't get a good degree in the first place, then the job market is much harder to go into. Um, I'd like to say, with all due respect, um, I think you, you, I think you know I would agree that obviously accessibility is important. And mm. as a former disabled students officer, I, I really made sure that the university created a plan for accessibility and have worked closely with the disabled students networks on, network on issues related to disabled students, and will continue to do so as a disabled student myself. However. The fact of the matter is the university has a plan for that and we are feeding into that. Whereas there is no plan for years in industry. There is no direction on jobs. So while undoubtedly accessibility is important and as a disabled student and as the person who represented disabled students on campus for two years, I know this to be true. I think we need to deal with the area where the university has no leadership and where they're not going anywhere to really step up to the plate. Okay, so how important is your academic ability sort of like achievement in getting a job actually so i'm going to use the example of uri i mean we're sitting here in a station that was built by students everything in it was built by students who then went into their industry um how do you intend on bringing that in so someone might not actually want a job in their academic subject and how do you kind of merge the two together so they can get their extracurricular in that also retain that element of employability instead of them just losing out because they studied education and want to go into engineering. I think that's an absolutely excellent point, Alex. And I think the way we have to do this is working with careers and tying in societies to our employability strategy. That means that careers should be working with societies to set up links. And I know that URY has excellent links with other radio stations. Careers should be working with that, saying, oh, you're a member of URY. Here are some interesting years in industry we can look at. They absolutely should not be specific to the subject. And I think societies have a huge role to play in that. And in fact, I'm going to be presenting at a conference about teaching and learning, about embedding employability into the curriculum. And I will be talking about the great role academic societies have on building a holistic student and how academic societies should be linked up with careers to get those years in industry as well. I think you are absolutely right that uh, societies do play a big role because we as students don't just have our academic lives, we have our social lives, we have our society lives, uh, so that is a very good idea. Um, and although I know that transferable skills is definitely a buzzword, I think it's, it's, it's a reality because there are so many things in my politics degree that I learned that I can put on my CV and that I can put on, on well, any other form of, I guess, mm. applying for things um, that I didn't previously have. So I think working with careers to make sure that students know what skills they can and can't put, what, what students can actually shine on, what they didn't think would be appropriate to put but is actually there, um, would, be, would be one of the things to work on. Um, and so, obviously, both of you are mentioned accessibility a lot and the employment aspect of it. But if you had to pick one of your one of your manifesto points that you could see done by the end of the year, that isn't one of those two. Just pick one, a singular one, one of the smaller ones that would make you really feel like you made a difference to students. Um, I 
got a text earlier from a friend saying uh, this is slightly related, but my mom, who is a lecturer at another university, saw that I liked your accessibility post on Facebook and changed her lecture slide colors. Um, and that was a really great moment for me because even I think that would be the point that I would I would try to get through is just changing lecture slides to be more accessible for students. And I know that goes back to accessibility, but I think it is a policy that is just simple. Just get lectures to change their, le change their lecture slides because it makes everyone's lives just that much easier. I think one of the policies that we could easily implement is ensuring students have the information they need for the lectures next year. We pay about 500 pounds per module. Now, I don't know about everyone watching, but when I pay 500 pounds for something, I want to know what I'm getting into. So I think one of the things I can really do is get departments to provide sample lectures. We've got three weeks of summer term after exams where those lecture theaters aren't being used. Get some sample lectures out there where people can see this is what I'm getting into. So if a student's thinking, I don't know what this lecture is, they sit down, they see it, and they say, oh, wait a minute, maybe that's not for me. Maybe I can switch, not pushing that towards the start of term. I think that's something that's easy to do. Lectures aren't actually using the time at that time. They're, um, they have the time to do it, so it's easy. It's a, not a large commitment from the lecturer. It would be yeah. massively beneficial to students. And also, getting reading lists is um, released before the start of term, but before the summer even starts. So let's say okay. you're interested in yeah. your next module, you can do the reading, come in if you're a particularly keen bean. Okay, so this one is one of those questions that I said earlier is going to be slightly different for the two of you, but I want to get same kind of answer so obviously tom you've already been uh, academic for the year but if you could change one thing that you did and tamaki if you could change one thing that tom did over Ooh. the year what would it be if i could change one thing i think what i i think what i would have done was wait for department reps to be appointed before meeting heads of department i don't regret necessarily meeting the heads of department without them, but I see now, looking back, how much more of a difference it could have made. It was a difficult call to make, of course, because it was the summer and it was a prime time to do so, which, yeah. and those department reps weren't appointed yet, and certain, um, but yes, if I could do something again, I would have, once the department rep was appointed, arranged a meeting with the head of department, with the chair of board of studies, to really you kick that into high gear, which I did at the start of this term. Okay. Um, this actually does have to do with what I would have done for myself as well. Uh, Tom and I were working to, I was, I am the current BME officer and Tom and I were working on looking at diversity within the curriculum. And I think the thing that I would have changed is that I would have worked alongside Tom a lot closer in trying to look at the curriculum and working with department reps and that is a big regret that I wasn't able to look further into it and do more research uh, over this year. I think don't be too hard on yourself actually because you know one of the things I did when I met with those heads of departments is I talked to them about this campaign and that has seen genuine changes. Um, philosophy producing a lot more modules that aren't Eurocentric, biology looking into non-Eurocentric work. I think there was obviously more mm. we could have done but I think you're your ideas led me to go around and, you know, your, your ideas led me to really take some action on that, which, I'm, which I think we should all be proud of. Okay. Mm. And now we're into the last minute, so mm. I'm going to ask you both a very quick fire question now. Okay. And it's going to be a tricky one. Very tricky. What does a faculty rep do? I would like to ask the faculty reps and get to know what they think they do. We've currently had interim faculty reps who have taken a role in looking at sort of the larger elements of our strategy. So some of them, have, so one of them has been very involved in leading the fight on lecture capture. Another one's been quite involved on um, our employability strategy. Um, the third one's been involved in looking at how we can engage course reps better. I think what I will do is, I think we need to ask them, but we need, we need to ask them and sit together and discuss what are our priorities for this year and have them take leads on it 
as well as represent that and see which policies they want to bring that benefit their faculty as okay. a whole to the faculty board. Well, that brings us to the end. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Candidates interview night 2016. Academic officer.